Thank you, Mr. Hey, thanks, Dan. Appreciate it. And thanks, everyone, for uh, taking an hour out of your day uh, to join us this afternoon. So in terms of an agenda, we're going to start by uh, just sharing some common challenges around leadership and project sponsorship. We'll then talk about some hot spots, which are potential points of resistance that we commonly see you know, working with our clients. And we'll talk about some, some recommendations on how to overcome some of the, that, that resistance and those challenges. And then we'll conclude with uh, a Q&A session. So in terms of a you know, high-level perspective, um, so a lot of you are project managers, and, and I think you've probably experienced this in the past. Often projects get initiated in an annual or you know, quarterly planning effort by an organization or a department. And there's you know, often a, a gap in time between when that project's initially thought of and, and potentially uh, you know, a high-level charter is developed to the time when the project actually begins. And Often, you know, there's also a, a gap in communication between the sponsor of the project and the project management team. So today we're going to talk about, you know, how do we kind of create a seamless transition between the time a, a project's originated, maybe, you know, the original idea of a project, and when we actually begin execution of the project. And just, you know, some more detailed challenges that, that are common. This is certainly not a comprehensive list, but some of the ones that we see most often. Um, in terms of an overemphasis on functional skills, so it's important, and we value, uh, you know, the, the PMI certification, PMP. But we feel, you know, very strongly that there's a lot of soft skills or leadership skills that are, that are critical to success, both as a project manager and as a sponsor. And we're going to dive into some of those details, some of the skills, capabilities that you know we kind of feel are important. Second uh, challenge: entrepreneurial skills are kind of out of sync with political reality. So uh, we live in a world where, unfortunately, you know there, there often is not a lot of loyalty between employers and employees, and, and vice versa. And Sometimes, you know, individuals, employees are seen as, as commodities that can be easily replaced. It, given that context, you know, it can be challenging for a project manager to, to speak the truth about the realities of the project. Again, we're going to talk about some of the, uh, the tools or techniques that you can utilize as a PM to kind of overcome this, this situation. Uh, related to that is kind of shoot the messenger mentality. You know, from my perspective, my experience, it's really the project manager's job to present the facts of the project, to be in control of the project, pr present the evidence or facts about how the project's progressing, and really present the options for stakeholders to choose from in terms of moving forward and overcoming obstacles. And, you know, this, you know, telling the truth isn't always uh, taken well, frankly, by, by executives or people people that have a lot, a lot of leverage over other employees. So that's, again, one, one of the challenges that we'll, we'll talk through today. Uh, there's also this paradox in terms of project managers uh, having, you know, really authority or, but, uh, or responsibility without authority. So um, more often than not, PMs are in a, a situation where the, the people that on their team are matrixed into them. They're, they're not directly reporting into the PMs. So it's a skill and a challenge to kind of persuade and influence the individuals that are um, really responsible for the success of the project without really having a direct managerial responsibility. Uh, often it's uh, also challenging, given the matrix uh, or organizational structure of a project, it's difficult to kind of push team members to deliver as promised since, you, again, they're not reporting to you in most cases. So there's some other, uh, I think, softer skills that come into play here in terms of working with those team members and sometimes working with those team members' uh, managers. 
Another common challenge, uh, so many projects, so little time. So um, it, it takes a fair amount of effort to manage a project in a way that I think manage, uh, project managers need to manage to be effective. If you have too many projects in your plate and um, you know, they're happening concurrently, it, it's really a challenge. I mean, to do not only the the day-to-day, -day, uh, what we call functional aspects of the project, but then also handling the, the soft skills and the communications, uh, setting expectations, negotiating with both uh, your, you know, your stakeholders, team members, etc. But this takes time, and if you're trying to juggle four, five, six, or more projects, it, you know, it, it's not, it, it's a difficult challenge. So we'll, we'll talk about some of those. Um, specific techniques or or things that need to change in order to manage a project appropriately. The last challenge we have on, uh, listed here is really uh, on the on the opposite side of the spectrum: the executives having the bandwidth and the know-how really to um, understand how to guide and direct a project, to remove obstacles, to work with the teams effectively. And to you know, kind of set the vision of the project, and work through execution in a you know kind of a streamlined fashion. Again, we'll go. We're, we're touching not only on project managers here, but but project leadership and project sponsors. In terms of you know, kind of critical competencies for successful project delivery, you've got the uh, functional skills, which are kind of a given. We, you know, we kind of see that as a uh, a ticket to get into the game. You know, these are the foundational skills that the uh, the PMP will test, and um, you know the skills that really are critical to success for a project. You know, the you know building the project plan, managing risk, uh, identifying critical path on the project, monitoring the projects for actuals against plan, understanding the variances. You know, how do we get back on track? Kind of the blocking and tackling of project management. What's often overlooked and just as critical, and from our perspective, if not more critical, especially as you move up the chain into program management, you're talking about leadership skills. So negotiation skills. Uh, how do you motivate you know your team members? How do you deal with conflict? You're going to have conflict on every project. Um, how do you help? Uh, Decision makers make good decisions, presenting information in a in a in a rational way, so that decisions can can get made uh, in the best way for the project to keep it moving forward. Uh, having the skills to kind of get along with folks on the team, uh, keeping uh, the project on track in in terms of the you know that vision and mission of the project. So again, we feel those those soft skills or leadership skills are just as important, if not more not more important than the functional skills and often overlooked. At this point, I'm going to pass the baton, although we're going to do this a little bit in tandem today. And I welcome here Gus Shikala talking about the predictable points of resistance. Thanks, Jim. Thanks for the introduction. Thanks, everybody. Uh, what I'm going to do for the next uh, 45 minutes or so is really go deeper into why leadership is so important uh, especially as we apply it to project management. I mean, there's a lot of definitions and a lot of attributes we can talk about for an effective leader. And what I really want to kind of try to focus in on is these places in a project where we can actually predict resistance. And, and oftentimes what we're talking about here is a uh, being out of sync with reality. Right? Oftentimes reality is one thing and the project plan is something else. And, um, and, and, and an alarming percentage of the project population uh, is okay with that. Uh, and, and so it's our job to face that, to face reality, essentially. So we'll talk about uh, an example of the predictable points of resistance in definition, uh, in initiation, in execution, and in closeout. And by the way, if we took the entire PMBOK and went through 800 pages, we could find 800 predictable points of resistance. We're going through for, for the big examples, right? The most common predictable points of resistance and, and why leadership matters. 
and you know, in our in our leadership workshop, we do um, this this whole thing about um, leadership is taken and not given, right? And and that's that's the title of our workshop for project managers. And a lot of that has to do with what Jim talked about uh, this this responsibility without the authority. And how do we really establish leadership in, in a place where not only is there sometimes a vacuum of leadership, but also a welcomeness that the project manager hasn't stepped up and talk about reality. So let's talk about reality. And here's here's a reality question. Uh, our first poll. So you should be seeing a poll on your screen. Yep. So what percentage of your projects I'm clearly defined charter. What percentage have clearly defined charters? You can't vote, Jim. Oh, come on. I wanted to vote. <laughs> Not fair. I'm just seeing if yours is sort of different, right? It doesn't look like that. Yeah. Here's the percentage of votes uh, per category. Okay. How do I show it? Close it. Okay, 10 seconds. Time is a running out. 9875342100. And share. Wow, that's a surprisingly low number, guys. Well, 27 percent. If we combine the last two, right, 15 and 12. Yeah. So less than half of projects. Yeah, only 25 percent of projects will most often uh, have a charter. So okay. A very low number. So let's talk about that. What does that mean? So, so as Jim talked about, you know, this 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 idea of time passing is is one aspect of this disconnect between the mission, values, vision, strategy, top part of the pyramid, with with the point of execution, which is which is where projects happen, right? It's it's, it's actually implementing uh, the business case, if you will, and. You know, if you think about this, close your eyes for a second and answer this question. Uh, you're going to put on a bathroom or you're going to put on a kitchen in your house. And you've got 25 proposals sitting on your desk or your kitchen counter. It has a big hole in it, um, which is why you're doing the kitchen, by the way. Um, and you're trying to figure out what's the best proposal? What's the best portfolio investment I can make in my asset called my home? And so if we say, what is the best project, you would start to think, if you think of it about this in, in your own personal terms, we would start thinking about uh, as we invest in this portfolio and, and, and this disconnect, how does this happen? So let's, let's talk about the attributes of a good project. The right project for your house would be the optimal risk. So, so, so Joe's um, um, deck company shows up and says, I'd like to do your kitchen. They can do That's it cheap. Great price. Awesome <laughs> price. Thanks, Jim. But no thanks, Jim. All right, so it's risky, right? Have you done this before? Uh, all the other things we can talk about risk. So we have like that the hop, uh, highest, uh, I've built a table before. you built a table. Okay, that's good. Have you done plumbing? I don't know how to spell plumbing. <laughs> okay, well then, so, so the ROI, um, you know, if you call your local realtor and say, am I better off? Uh, putting a man cave in the in the basement or a kitchen uh, on the first floor. Kitchen. Um, yeah. So we got we got to think about that, right? Um, most cost effective. Alignment to vision. Ideal timing. Market need. I mean, when we start thinking about all these things that define feasibility, and I and I put a couple things in parentheses here, and it says budget, schedule, specs, and resources. And the point is, oftentimes, 
these aspects of a project are defined well before the project starts. Right? So now when we say, well, what, you know, what's the definition of done right? So right projects done right, that's what this pyramid's all about. How do we make sure we're investing in the right projects to make sure that we actually get it done correctly, which usually sounds like on time, on budget, on spec. So here I come into my project, I pick it up, a brand new spec and project, and we see a disconnect sometimes right out of the gate. Sometimes that, that $50,000 project for the kitchen that was supposed to take six weeks, we take a closer look at it, it's going to be 100000 and it's going to take 12 weeks. But I don't think I can eat Domino's pizza for 12 weeks. So how are we going to deal with this, right? And, and, and so the first predictable point of resistance really deals with the resistance, right? When we say this can't be done, and it's so obvious, um, if, you, if you know this fairy tale, this idea of uh, the emperor's new clothes, you know, the, the, the storyline here or the, um, the point of the story is that when something is so obviously wrong, why does nobody speak up, right? And, and in this picture, we see um, people are pretty horrified and embarrassed, but nobody's telling the king. But there is one character in this picture here that's ready to say the emperor has no clothes, right? And this is, the, in this case, it's the project manager here. If you look at the little boy, this is the one who's who's peeking and saying, there's something wrong. He's yelling out, you have no clothes. And it's because he doesn't know about this, right? So, so we have this, you know, the political resistance is it's unpopular and oftentimes un not allowed to point out that we have a disconnect. You see the trying to cover the PM's eyes, guys. Yeah. Yeah, the other no, stakeholders. Did you get the sponsor? <laughs> <laughs> With a burka? <laughs> so, you know, this... So the political resistance, you know, the entrepreneurial skills to say, how do we put, we bring those soft skills to say, how are we going to deal with this question? Have you ever been assigned to lead an approved project, sanctioned by management that already appears to have an unrealistic schedule and budget as compared to the expected scope? So, so this is uh, an opportunity for us to test do we shoot messengers, right? And a lot of times uh, the answer is yes or at least we're, we're, we're made to feel that way, right? Be a good sport. Please try to make it work. And what we do is, is, is we resist the, the, the um, triple constraint model, right? The on-time, on-budget. On or space. maybe we can find another PM that'll do it. Yeah, and you know, I'm okay with that if I'm the project manager, right? But I think, <laughs> let somebody else go to the guillotine. Okay, so, so the problem here is this, this, uh, this, this human nature problem that we have, right? It's human nature. Mm -hmm to deal with bad news in a different way than project managers are dealing with it. If we are seeing, or if, we be, if we're being asked to do a better job of expectation management, did something good or something bad just happen? Hey, Jim, you need to do a better job of expectation management. Usually that follows some headlines that are not so good, right? And here's the problem. Why didn't you tell me sooner? And here's the question. This is not a poll question, because I know what everybody would say. Is it human? to A, seek pain and avoid pleasure, or to seek pleasure and avoid pain. And we know that B is the answer. That's human nature. For most people. Yeah, but what if, what if I'm a project manager, Jim? Going to run and hide. Going to run and hide. Yeah, so, so, so delivering bad news is seeking pain early, right? Is, is bringing the bad news early. Oftentimes, uh, the bad news could even be something that hasn't happened yet. You know, when we deliver our risk management uh, workshop, I ask management, are you sure that you want to give license to your project managers to talk about things that might go wrong? Why are you so negative? Are you chicken little? Is the sky falling? I mean, those are the kinds of questions it feels like we're getting, right? So, so this is um, uh, a real challenge for a project manager and a sponsor to be a good sponsor and say, we have bad news. Let's deal with it now. Let's deal with it up front. We'll talk about unmet challenges at the back end of this project, at the back end of this presentation. This is the time we have to face the music. Okay? And if we don't, what happens? Uh, many of you have seen this graph. You know, if it costs me a dollar to fix something during the definition phase, so when we're writing the charter, uh, versus having it come out in the requirements of the product or the project or the software, whatever it happens to be that you're building, it's going to cost us $10. 
this is a logarithmic scale. It goes up, exp not exponentially, but by powers of 10. And it just keeps going and going and going to the point where if we let it stew and we let it fester, eventually the infection cannot be cured. It's going to kill. Come clean early. Come clean, clean early or kill the project later. And um, so what needs to change, right? And, you know, you see the little graphic here. And we see the overlaps, good, fast, cheap. Sometimes you've heard that, pick any two, right? And if we pick good and fast, we get expensive. If we pick good and cheap, we get slow. If we get fast and cheap, we get ugly. And if we try to get all three together, we get impossible, right? So what needs to change? What we're going to talk about here is, you know, what does need to change? The sponsors should not drop six months, six million, and make it work on the PM's desk without expecting their feedback. Right? We put a project manager on this for a reason, to synchronize reality with the plan. And some say, you know, what would we rather do? Change reality or change the plan? What does the business want to do, Jim? Do they want to change reality or change the plan? They, they resist changing the plan. Yeah, to do. Pull out your magic wand and make the future different. Right? So that, that's a tough one. And that's not really that's not feasible. It's not realistic. Um, so a meeting of the mind between project sponsors and project managers. That's what we need. Okay? Uh, what, what does a project manager need? Data. You can't just say this is impossible. As a matter of fact, if we're good risk managers, we don't say this can't be done. We use a risk language. There's a high probability that this is not going to make the schedule if we don't do X, Y, and Z. If you want to increase the odds of a successful finish, we should add some time and add some funding. And here's the data. Here's the proof. Here's the schedule. Here's the information I've gathered to prove that this is going to take longer. Yeah, I think that's a good technique for sharing that information. Because I think it's a, it's a language that a, a smart business person will understand. Yes. Bring the data, bring the rationale. And by the way, it takes skills, right? It takes persuasion, it takes negotiation, it takes timing. It's, you know, and we'll, we'll talk about that in a minute. It takes homework, too. It takes homework, yeah. So we want to create the license to build the lines of communications between these two people. Oftentimes, this is not the project manager's job or authority. It's got to come from the sponsors. So anybody who signed up this for this webinar today because you're a sponsor, the idea is how do we create that partnership with the project manager and give them the credibility and give them the opportunity to generate the options. Mm. Not just we have a problem, we as sponsors should expect what, what are the alternatives, what are the recommendations. So we've got to present reality, right? Make them understand what, what, what can happen. The, the triangle we're talking about is, is, is uh, scope schedule resource, right? How do we manipulate that triple constraint model to give us something working or pretend, right? We can't pretend. When we pretend that the scope increases and we don't change the schedule of the resources, what leaks out the back is quality. So uh, creating a new uh, baseline, right? Sometimes we have this thing like an un uh, a best un uneducated guess. Oftentimes is, is really what's happening in a uh, proposed project in the portfolio. There's not a lot of educated guessing. There's really uneducated guessing. And what we at least want to get to is an educated guess based on some level of assumptions, what I like to call uh, size and scoping assumptions. Right? If those things don't exist, it's pretty hard to define why things have to change. So when we talk about skills, uh, delegation, right? And oftentimes this comes from, let's say, the president or vice president of a, divi of a division that has to trust sponsors at the, at the, sub uh, the committee level, the oversight bodies. Uh, negotiation, absolutely uh, critical here. And, uh, and there's some really great books on that. But I mean, we, you know, we as project managers and sponsors really need to understand some of the fundamentals of negotiation, understanding both sides, knowing what your walk away position is. My right? political savvy, gifts and golf, good interpersonal skills, gets along with everyone. Right? So it helps to get along. When we screen our project managers, we staff project managers, this is a big one. You know, are project managers able to be persuasive by not making enemies? Making enemies is not a good way to win arguments, right? And obviously the process area knowledge, right? How do you build a charter? How do, what, what is project definition? What, what, are, what are the things that should be in a charter that are measurable, definable, and, and, and verifiable, unambiguous? So that brings us to yet another poll. 
Poll number two. Poll number two. Here it comes. What percent of your projects have experienced or will experience a change in scope? Hmm. Oh, it tells me here organizers and panelists do not know. The results are coming through. 70% have voted. High voter turnout on this one. All right. 10 seconds. Not, not a big surprise here, guys. I'm a little surprised, actually. <coughs> Well, I, it's, it's top-heavy. It's top we expected that, Yeah, right? I did expect that, but I'm surprised at this, this number. Hire that project manager. 25%. That's pretty good. Now, we have a mixture of audience today. We're just not all project Well, we have just project managers. And the answers are close to 100, aren't they? Typically, yeah. yeah. But, but, but the answer is a high percentage. Right, six is clearly a high percentage of scope change. So why are we talking about that? Well, we talked about the triple constraint model, scope schedule resource, and um, what we're really looking at here is, uh, you know, when we think about initiating a project, kicking off a project, I, you know, I, I, I view that as the first public opportunity to do what I call the Al Haig thing. Alexander Haig that took, you know, took the helm when Reagan got shot and said, as of now, I'm in control here in the White House. Highly criticized for that, but but really there was a vacuum in leadership, and we get this opportunity to stand at the mic and grab it and say, as of now, I'm in control here of the project, right? And what does control mean? Uh, what do people expect to hear in a kickoff? And what I've been taught and what I've experienced is our teams, our sponsors, the business expect to hear how we're going to deliver on time, on budget, on spec. What is the plan? And and when we do that. There's there's a problem, right? And and one of the problems is, you know, let, let's let's go right back to the poll question. If a project management coroner performed a post a post mortem on your organization's failed projects, what would be the findings as a common pattern in the cause of death? So if you if you were the coroner and you were writing on this little toe tag here, we might type something like scope creep. And you know when I, when when, when when we do this interactively, and we have a group of people around project sponsors, project managers, they don't say scope change. They say scope creep. <laughs> Almost always they say creep. And you know, in, in a, if, if if I say what does creep mean, they start talking about you know the people they hope that they don't they, they hope they don't see near the schoolyard. But I'm talking about the verb creep, right? And the that, verb doesn't always happen that way. What's that? A little bit at a time. No, some, sometimes it doesn't, but <laughs> oftentimes the ones that kill it are the creeps that, that we don't deal with. Right? Yeah. yeah. It's this idea that it doesn't leap, it creeps. And the leap we'll see, uh, we see the parable of the frog, right? That's, that's, the, that's the temperature creep. You throw a frog into a pot of boiling water and it jumps out. You put it, on, you put it on room temperature and turn it on low, and the frog slowly boils. And it's this idea of us not recognizing or allowing small changes in the environment right and you know and so you know if, if, if we ask this question or if we walk into a, um, a kickoff and we say okay 75 percent of projects are going to experience uh, a scope creep and we're going to have to deal with it and by the way when, when scope increases um, we have this thing called the triple constraint model which means sponsor business investors we're going to need more money. We're going to need more resources, and that's where this NIMBY thing comes up. If you don't know what NIMBY means, um, if picture might give you a hint. Okay, it's this idea of okay, we need nuclear power plants and prisons, but not in my backyard. Oh yeah, scope change happens as long as I'm in the 25 or 10 percent or 5 percent or 1 percent of projects that never see scope creep. We're going to be cool. Right, so there tends to be a sense of denial around this. It's an unpopular subject. This is an expectation management thing, right? 
am I going to bring the bad news early? If I'm kicking off a project, the bad news is uh, unexpected risks are going to happen in your project. Nuclear plants are going to melt down. There are going to be jailbreaks. There's going to be prisoners in your backyard. That's why you don't want it there, okay? Because they're going to jump your fence first. Um, so we've got to deal with this, this this problem, right? So what I have found is the first mention of the triple constraint model is I call it the hand grenade, right? Actually, that's the second one. The first one is when we talk about this in a kickoff, oftentimes there's a pause, there's a discussion, there's a, an unpleasant feeling, and we get past it. We survive it. Okay, it, we've done it done well. We get past the fact that we are going to have changes, and there's going to be a documented, orderly process, which I'll show in a moment. Scope increase means impact to schedule and resources. I have to do an, you know, these things are disruptive, right? Even if I, even if we're not going to implement the change, if I'm the project manager, am I the one who's going to do the impact analysis? What do you think, Jim? I think the PM should at least own the analysis, but I I would try to delegate, if possible, to the per person actually doing the work. Doing the work, yeah. We've got technicians out there, whether they're engineers, whether they're uh, software developers. The people who have to do the work have to do the analysis. And oh, by the way, what are they working on now? I'm, on, I'm looking at the critical path of my project. Oh, my Lord. My developers are do, doing development work. Yeah. Who would have thunk? Right, so even if we plan for impact analysis, even if we budget impact analysis, it's disruptive at best. Mm -hmm. We can't schedule it. We can budget it, but we really can't schedule it. Yeah, can you put uh, lag in your task? Can you put uh, management reserves? Absolutely, and I would recommend all those things, and I hope you get away with it. Great. Right? Don't tell anybody. Keep it a secret. Keep it a secret until you need it. We're doing it for the best of the organization. So the budget for impact analysis and small changes, yes, we charge for estimates. What do you mean? You're going to charge me? You're charging impact analysis to my project? Yes, I am. Or what I might say is we put we have a 20,000 hour project. We have 2,000 hours of project management time. I'm going to spend 200 hours on impact analysis. We've got a budget. Before I do an impact analysis, you're going to approve my valuable time and my team's valuable time to look at that impact analysis. Yeah. No surprises. And what I find is when I do that and I have a single point of contact, they will throttle and governor and put a governor on the use of those precious impact analysis hours. Some changes will never get to my desk because they'll squelch it first. So we get some help. We get a partnership. Now we've got something more Good important. Point. Right? And the first one I call the hand grenade. Oh, come on. Be a good sport. Come on, project manager. You can do the first one for free, can't you? And this is where this is where the pattern begins, right? This is a predictable point of resistance. <laughs> Just okay. throw it in there. Just throw it in there. Be a good sport. Why are you nickel and dime me to death? <laughs> right? And those nickels and dimes start to, 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 to pile up. So sometimes I suggest a small change budget. We have an impact analysis budget. Fifty of those hours are set aside to do small changes. So next time you say, give me a freebie, it's a small one, I say, if it's under 50 hours, it's small. If it's 49 hours, you want to use 49 of your 50 hours of small changes? Or we can say it's five hours. We'll do a freebie for five hours. It's already in the budget. Thank you. All right. The second one is easier. The third one, a little bit easier. Now we're exercising a muscle. As a matter of fact, what the customer eventually recognizes, they expect it. And we get done. My Lord, we actually delivered something. We had a pile of stuff that could wait. It's sitting on the backlog. It's sitting in the enhancement log. And, and now we've got a project that's up and running. Right? So, um, so how does it work? So yeah, we, get, we talked about the small change. Uh, a PCR to increase the budget for impact analysis. I did this on a real project. I had 200 hours of impact analysis. And we had the customer sign off. I'll show you the form in a second to approve the use of impact analysis hours. And we ran out of the impact analysis budget. I said, what do you want to do? They said, we're not going to change anything anymore. I said, OK. And the next change came along. They said, can you do an impact analysis? I'm out of budget. It's impact analysis can be out of scope. Is it realistic? I don't think so, but it's a language we're using, right? We're, we're, we're dealing with that predictable point of resistance 
with handling an objection in a professional way, hopefully. So we talked about the single point. Yes, they will squelch some of them out. And, uh, and the procedure, I'm not going to read this, by the way. Um, sometimes we get uh, a host of emails at the end of this presentation uh, asking for a copy of the slides. We will post them. Okay. So this is a, a scope change procedure, and it speaks to getting approval to do an, an analysis. It talks about getting a sign off. It talks about something I'm going to talk to you about on the form here, um, recommendation for analysis. The approval to complete the impact analysis signed by the project manager and the project sponsor. And I check the box. I reject the recommendation for an impact analysis. I think it's a bad idea. Who wins the argument, Jim? Usually not the PM. No, not the PM. <laughs> so this is my CYA file. That's all it is. <laughs> I told you we shouldn't do this. Now the project's up in flames, and we have a six-month delay. Okay. So it's uh, it's a recommendation, but that's all it is, right? And then we get a sign off to actually implement it. We talk about the scope impact. We talk about the results of the impact analysis, and then we get it we get it done. So, in order for this to work, what needs to change in most organizations? If this isn't working in your organization, what might we need to change? You need to be a gymnast. You need to bend over backwards. Yeah, that's probably what it's. It's a virtual gymnast. <laughs> Uh, hopefully not with a red tie. PM needs to go to sponsor with options. If all options are denied, the sponsor is the one choosing the project's fate or failure. All, deni all, de all options denied means we've got a scope change, and we won't change the budget, and we won't change the schedule, so we're going to pretend for a while, and it's only for a while. Okay. By the way, when we talk about quality leaks, we're talking about usually the things that happen at the end of the project. We may put the appropriate time, but eventually things start to pile up. Right? So what's at the end? The testing, the training, the documentation, the things that really start to instill quality in the solution start to be compromised. Right. Whether we acknowledge, acknowledge it or not, that's in fact what often happens. Right? So we license our project managers to employ scope change. We accept it up front, and we use this orderly process. Right? We try not to shoot the messenger. This should be on every step. Right, have a flexible, adaptable sponsor. You know, uh, I, I view the term project management very much synonymous with change management. Right? We are managing change of the unfolding reality and the, re and the responses of the plan changing to that reality. Right? This is an orderly process. And you know, I, I find it, um, I guess I'll use the word disturbing. When people say agile, which is if you're not in the software world, agile is a uh, contemporary software development technique, does not live uh, in coexistence, in peaceful coexistence, with traditional project management. And a lot of that comes from the idea that agile is flexible and project management is not. And nothing could be more, more further from the truth. Right? Project management is the way to create flexibility. We make it resistance. That's what we're talking about today. How do we deal with the resistance? Right? And how do we deal with the resistance? Well, again, here comes negotiation. Composure is a good one. That's the opposite of getting angry and violent in front of your customer. Okay. So, uh, yeah, conflict management. Um, you know, a lot of times when I ask project managers, why do you say yes to the freebie? Um, that's their answer. Yeah. Right. I want a satisfied customer. Decision making. Uh, the ability to make the decision, oftentimes the decision is to, is to say no uh, with a smile, uh, with some political savvy. And planning and estimating, obviously. If we're going to do impact analysis, we've got to go out and get the data. Yep, have your facts. OK. So this brings us to poll number three. Poll number three. How many projects do you currently manage? Is that the end of that one? <laughs> That's all right. That's all right. We'll, we'll keep moving. We'll come back to that poll. So when we get to the concept of execution, um, I like to put this. Uh, this is this is a, a reference to the Harvard Business Review, uh, an article called "The Execution Trap." But it was really quoting um, Sun Tzu from The Art of War, which was written, I think, in 600 BC or something like that. Uh, so this is a very popular 
quote, a mediocre strategy well executed is better than a great strategy poorly executed. And at the end of the day, it's about execution, right? Or as, um, or as Jerry Seinfeld once said, anybody can take the reservation. It's <laughs> keeping the reservation that counts. Right? <laughs> so, and what he was saying is, yeah, we can plan to do anything we want, but uh, now we want to be able to do it um, in, the, in a point where we actually deliver. And then we have a poll now. Our poll came back. I think it's back. It's back. How many projects do you concurrently manage? Oh, man. Project managers. This is painful. It's, I'm afraid of the answer. I've heard this. I've heard this answer before. I've already seen the starting results. Almost forty percent, Gus, at five plus. Yeah. Over forty percent. Uh, all right. Five seconds. We'll shut it down. We've got seventy-five voting. We have a thirty percent. And whoa. That's a little surprising. I know I knew it would be high. I guess we should have done six, seven, eight, nine, ten, huh? <laughs> Never would have thought it. So, so those, uh, the, so forty percent of these people will feel the pain, or who are feeling the pain of this next module about execution, right? How does the project get to be a year late? This is from a book called The Mythical Man Month, Fred Brooks, and Fred said, gave us this answer: one day at a time, right? It happens in small increments, oftentimes. And therefore, we have to think about how do we spot this one day at a time increment? And here's, here's the answer, right? Control, the definition of being in project control is an objective definition. Objectively, it means you're doing the control activities. What do we mean the, on a regular basis? Probably weekly, right? I heard bi-weekly yesterday with our friends up in uh, you know where. Yeah. Um, and that's okay, yeah. right? That was their answer. Their $50 million projects, okay, you might be ever doing every two weeks. Tracking progress, analyzing variances to the baseline. Are we still making our commitments? What's the baseline? The baseline, the original estimate. Usually, if we're talking about Microsoft Project, which is one of our areas of expertise, is um, the cost, the labor, and the schedule. Is it on? Are all those three dimensions uh, still acting as expected? Proactively managing risk, is, risk and, and issues. Not reactively, but proactively. Controlling scope changes, communicate, 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 oftentimes called status reporting. I thought this when I was a young man as a project manager, which was a long time ago when I was a young man. Um, I thought communication, like, I, I was just sending a status report. That was pretty good. I, I thought communication was me telling everybody what to do. Right? And what I learned is that God gave me two ears and one mouth for a reason. Okay, so this idea of really listening, how do I find out that there's a risk in my project? How do I find out that there's an issue? How do I find out that there's a scope change? There's a communication protocol, and it doesn't mean the project manager knows everything all the time. But we've got to do these things, right? So does the control mean success? No, we're, we're the reporter. According to that definition, can I be in control and deliver over budget and late? And the answer is yes. I'm reporting, I'm on top of it, I'm in control. Control doesn't mean I can force it to deliver on time. It means I know where I'm, I am. Situational awareness. <laughs> can I be out of control and deliver on time on budget? Yes, not often. Yeah, I'll put an asterisk next to that. <laughs> um, there's probably a leadership vacuum if you're not in control. Somebody else actually delivered and you got credit maybe, <laughs> right? So oftentimes if you're out of control, uh, this is an accident or it's good luck. And Sometimes you'd rather be lucky than good. Um, so this, you know, the reason we brought that poll up is, is you know, this, acknowledging the predictable point of resistance here is how can I establish the project cadence and tempo and do this administrative stuff, which I don't like to do. I don't like taking meeting meetings, meeting, meeting, <laughs> yeah, meeting minutes. I don't like having to document. I, I wrote a book on Microsoft Project, but I'd rather not spend all my time in Microsoft Project updating actuals and looking at variances of the baseline. But I got to do it. Right. And what I found is when I did this cadence and tempo thing, two things. It took a lot of time, and I I actually did establish control. When I'm writing the minutes, when I'm reporting the uh, the, the the issues, when I'm suggesting the solutions, and I'm calling the meetings, I am in control, and it takes time. Mm -hmm. So how do you run five projects, ten projects, and do this stuff on a regular basis? And you know, if they're very small projects, okay. 
if they're starting to be larger projects, we usually have the problem that we're not paying attention in the middle of this project while I'm running the beginning and endings of my other project. Right. I'm dealing with the, the carnage of the of the definition that we talked about, the emperor's no clothes, and I'm out of sync, and I'm dealing with that piece, we're up at the end, when everybody said no to all my changes, now I'm, not, I'm trying to cram in 17 scope changes and it doesn't fit, right? So, so this is a problem. So the predictable point of resistance is, you know, how do I deal with this? And by the way, when I have bad news, who wants to hear it? The last person that wants to hear it is the project manager, right? So one of the things we, we, can, we, we do is we go through the five stages of, of death, right? First one's uh, denial. And this is the, not the five stages of death, the five stages of grief. In this case, I'm grieving the loss of my project, <laughs> okay? And uh, so a project manager who's facing reality of a terminal project will go through the five stages of grief, and you can get stuck in a stage, oftentimes denial is where we get stuck. So we hang on and we hang on, we hang on, and we keep moving towards disaster. I asked this question to a group of project managers. How many people work in an organization that has a formal kill switch on their projects? A formal cancellation? And not many hands go up. Right. So here's, what, here's the follow-up question. If the bridge is out five miles down the road, the tracks are out on the railroad tracks, and the train has left the station, and we know the bridge is out, then we stop the train. Nope. So what needs to change? Say no to unrealistic expectations. They can only fire you once. Give PMs a realistic workload for the sponsors. If we want them to be in control, give them the opportunity to be control, in control. Okay? Read the KPIs and believe what they tell you. That's the denial part, right? If it's saying there's trouble coming, and if, well, by the way, a tool like Microsoft Project, when you like work variance, cost variance, start variance, finish variance, they can be predictive. It can be an EAC. You have some actuals. You have some time to recover. If we stay on top of it, we have more options. So we can't always make up the time later. Let's make it up now. So uh, what, are the, what are the skills necessary? We see a lot of these soft skills here. And then at the end, we talk about scheduled maintenance, building reports, monitoring actuals, okay, in addition to all the other things about keeping the business plan on track. So we come to project closeout with 10 minutes to go. So our next poll, drum roll please. Here we go. Does your organization have a formal sign-off process? Formal sign-off process, yeah, that's a good one. Uh, you know, I, I see a big difference uh, while you're thinking about this. Internal projects, IT projects, for example, versus product development projects, right. or professional services. Um, what does a sign-off mean in an internal organization? The paper is written on, maybe. Um, can I take you to court? Probably not. So what do we got? Uh, a big yes number. Good. Got good news? That's pretty good. You know, I probably should have asked a follow-up question. Do you use it? Yes, but not implemented, yeah. Yeah, some of those. I mean, yeah, some of those. One out of 14, right? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thanks for all those responses to the polls. We got one more coming up soon. So project closeout, right? Defining, driving, and meeting completion criteria. The question is, did we define completion criteria? Um, you deliver what you think you promised, but the customer didn't, doesn't get what they thought they bought, right? That shouldn't be a surprise, right? We should have completion criteria. We should follow up on the out-of-scope activities, hand off to stakeholders, and the snowball of unmet challenges from the earlier stages, you know. <laughs> If, if, if we've been in denial, uh, eventually reality wins. Mm -hmm. Eventually reality wins. So I'd like to talk a little bit just about this uh, Newton's first law of motion. And it says that a body of rest, a body of motion state will stay in motion, a body of rest will remain at rest unless acted on by an outside force. And this is really about this idea of sign off. Uh, when I was at, at IBM Professional Services, we had a uh, an assumed accepted uh, delivery uh, process and here's how it went. I give you the deliverable, and it says it's assumed accepted unless reasons for rejection are documented in writing within three days. And oh, by the way, those reasons have to be in 
the scope. If they're out of scope, we might be able to make those changes, but we're going to do an impact analysis and maybe we need more schedule, whatever. But what's the point? The point is that a sign-off is not a single event in a, in a project if we're doing it well. Right? There, are, there are multiple stages and multiple deliverables or multiple phases in which sometimes we, talk, we call this stage game. Right? But the idea is how do we create incremental, uh, incremental finishes? So, so from this standpoint, we call it a first down strategy. Right? We don't, we don't always just try to, if you're, if you're not into football, sorry about that, but you know, in one play try to make the score. Usually football is an incremental sport where we move down the field in a deliberate fashion and eventually get to the, to the goal line. Um, so what does that mean? Clear definition of criteria in the project plan. The, cri the completion criteria, how is it stated in the project plan, probably in the charter, which is part of the project plan. Proactive planning of transition from project mode to go live. Right? So sometimes we can't close some projects because people are afraid if you're going to leave. What's life going to be like without Jim? And sometimes that's a frightening prospect. So you know, it's like any leadership position. If we want to secede our leadership position, we have to plan for succession. Mm -hmm. right? So it's really succession planning, if you think about it that way, as a leader. Right? So what are the skills? Dealing with ambiguity. Because right? if there's ambiguity, it's going to show up eventually. It's going to show up in the resistance to, to acceptance. Uh, the written communications, negotiation, political savvy, conflict management, managing vision and purpose. And by the way, I like this one coming up because when we talk about on time, on budget, on spec, I don't know how many of us as project managers or sponsors think about this thing called benefits realization. You know, have we really delivered the promise of the objective, the measurable benefits that were supposed to come out of this investment? Right. Right? And that's something we really should feel responsibility for. And a good portfolio and project management governance process will hold accountability to the project team. Not necessarily to the project manager, but to the project team, and especially the, the, the business that, that suggests that we spend a lot of money and a lot of effort and a lot of uh, uh, blood, sweat, and tears to get this thing to the finish line. Did it really deliver the promise? Right. right? And that's a big part of the reporting. Did we learn anything? So we only have a few minutes. So uh, Jim, take it from here. Thank you. <laughs> you got it. Here we, we're kind of just summarizing. You know, which, which skills are critical and at which stages of the game, and you know, kind of runs the gamut. Really, uh, you know, these soft skills are critical throughout the life of the project. I will say that um, having great functional skills is huge in terms of being able to utilize the leadership skills. So having the good information that's accurate and timely will give you credibility. And then you'll be more effective in, in, in uh, executing the soft skills of the project. It's a daunting list of skills. So uh, it's in terms of project uh, assistance, these are solutions that we offer in this space. It's certainly. Uh, we're a Microsoft partner for, I guess, 20 years now, Gus, delivering Project Server and now Project Online. We offer training programs, uh, you know, specific to leadership, both for sponsors and PMs, uh, along with uh, many other project management courses. Uh, we offer project management staffing. We call it the virtual PMO. And we help organizations uh, kind of create a, a vision in terms of project portfolio management and delivery in what we call our analysis vision roadmap offering. The two specific workshops, uh, leading project leaders and leadership just taken not given. So the first one there is focused on the project sponsor. How do, how do you become a better project sponsor? How do you lead the project teams? And the second one focused on, on project managers. Our next webinar. Ah, conquering the challenges of resource management. Um, we have more and more inquiries uh, on this topic, and uh, one, one I think is getting a lot of traction you know, in many organizations. A very difficult challenge to overcome, but, but one that has huge value add. We're going to talk about that on July 27th. And as usual, some parting gifts for you. 
we'll post this webinar uh, on our website where you offer a chapter from Gus's book, Microsoft Project 2013, now available in, uh, I guess, two new editions, Gus. Do you want to talk about that briefly? Yeah, the second edition has been picked up by Kendall Hunt Publishing. Uh, the academic edition will be going to the university market, and the industry uh, edition will be available uh, for industry, for, for businesses, and uh, KendallHunt.com, K-E-N-D-A-L-L, Hunt.com, find my last name, you'll find the book. Thanks, Jim. I think we're into Q&A at this point. We, uh, we're about out of time, unfortunately. Do we have one or two questions we can answer quickly? Actually, we haven't had any questions roll in, but uh, feel free to ask. I'll also uh, launch our final poll in case you want to reach out to us. Um, but no questions at this time. Okay, well, probably a good thing at 3.59. <laughs> so thank you everyone so much for attending. And again, as we just said, the slide deck as well as the recording will be up on uh, projectassistance.com slash webinar. And uh, we, we do have information about getting PDU credit up there as well. Um, so yeah, so you get one uh, PDU credit, uh, use Category B. Category B, right, you get one hour uh, when you make that claim? Yes. And can we show the last slide? While we say goodbye? Okay, thank you everybody. And uh, we'll see you on July 27th, if not sooner. Thank you.